Good morning, everybody. Hey. Can't start. Okay. Good. You are live and on camera here. Okay. Well, I got here at nine, and I thought that there were we were starting at nine, and there were four people in the room. So I'm really gratified. This <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to pick up from where we left off yesterday. And yesterday was really time to just lay a foundation, so we've got a, a common understanding of you know, what has transpired with making these tools and how empowering they are, and um, how those developments have caused this movement where maker spaces are popping up everywhere. I didn't mention it yesterday, but in 2005, there were probably only three or four maker spaces in the world, and they were in Germany. There are over 1,100 now. This eight years later, it's not as though there's some central organization with hundreds of millions of dollars making this happen. It's just happening. And so you know that something important is going on when that kind of thing happens all by itself. It's kind of a, a big change. But these makerspaces were doing a lot of things, and one of the things that I called magic yesterday was something I didn't understand until I understood about participatory learning how that was one of the great things that was going on in these places. So today I'm going to pick up where I left off. Uh, again, when I got started on this, I went to a maker fair, a 25 year old, that is to say 25 years after leaving my engineering degree, I went back and, and, and found a love for all this making that was going on, I had to figure it out. And uh, we learned yesterday that one of the things was these maker spaces with the tools, uh, I found that there was just learning going on by creating things together, tools that are dramatically improved and cheaper. Uh, the internet has allowed us to collaborate on projects, to share designs, and that these things are sort of the ingredients that are fostering all this uh, activity. And I find that the transformative impact of this could be huge. I mean, that's why educators are so interested in this. That's why economic development councils are so interested in this. That's why science museums are really intrigued by the notion of incorporating some of these things into their programs. And libraries are very interested in this. So there's, there's something going on. And as I went through and I visited all these makerspaces, one of the things I came away with was the feeling that as much as I love makerspaces, they're just not here for the long term. They're a bunch of people who've decided to get together. And as long as Bob's there holding it together, maybe it'll continue. Maybe these three people in this other maker space, as long as they're really enthused, great, but then all of a sudden the family changes and that maker space falls apart. They're just not for the long term. If this, if this goodness is going to make it into the mainstream and transform society, it had to get into institutions. And so of the list of institutions that I listed, one of the ones that jumps out to me is libraries. And I visited now many libraries. It really started because I, I, um, I kind of was intrigued. I love road trips. I love to go on old roads and like the Lincoln Highway or the two across the U.S. northern border or uh, Route 66 or whatever. And when I do that, I come into a town and occasionally I'll find the most beautiful building in town. What is it? It's the Carnegie Library, absolutely right. Time and time again, I'd go into a town, and there would be this stunning example of beautiful architecture. It was just such a symbol to learning, to books, to a great institution. And as I was traveling, and as this theme was developing in me, I started to figure that I wanted to know more about what was going on in libraries. And so when I'd visit libraries, I'd ask them about their mission. Now, it's not, actually, it's not something you can usually pull from somebody that you walk into a library and say, oh, hi, what's your mission here? You know, it's not the kind of thing you elicit very easily. But as I learned what people felt the mission of libraries was, I also distilled a version from that, a little bit self-serving, but um, it's this. It's to deliver tools and programs for lifelong learning, where currently tools is defined as books and other media, other sorts of resources like that. Programs, you folks know the ones that you run in libraries. And this lifelong learning business is something that I didn't properly appreciate until I realized one day that whenever I wanted to do something and I wasn't involved in getting a degree or graduating from high school or getting a certificate, this is the place I'd go. This is where I'd go to get that learning between the between times, the rest of my life, when I'm not necessarily engaged in a school or some sort of certification program. 
And yet that mission, if it were redefined slightly, could open the door for things such as these media centers in libraries where there are all sorts of learning activities going on, maker spaces in libraries where there's all sorts of learning activity going on, where tools is redefined to mean tools. <laughs> Programs can be expanded to just activities around making and tools, and learning is still an integral part of that. That's what we talked about yesterday with the participatory learning. So a future could sprout from making in libraries, and especially as I've talked with people, I guess really during the 2008, 2009, as people were feeling the budget crunches <coughs> extraordinarily, there was this question about, we got our funding this year, or we weren't cut as badly as we could have been, but if we don't adapt to this new reality where internet is much more broadly available, books as in a printed form are being redefined, etc. Might there come a day when the people who have supported us so loyally in our, um, in our communities say, well, that's not necessarily where we're going to put our funds. So might it be an opportunity then to look at something like this, redefine, reinterpret the mission, and come up with new strategies. So that was uh, one of the things that got me to want to talk with more and more libraries. So I went and visited many libraries. And this is, as I said in the title of this presentation, um, insights that are garnered from the community of libraries. First thing I'm going to talk about is stages of readiness. And uh, stages of readiness are when I walked into a library, based on a few variables, how open that library appeared to me to be to the idea of making. How open would they be to, say, the smoke from a soldering iron wafting through the air? You know? how, how, how happy would they be if somebody actually had a conversation in a part of the library that wasn't necessarily labeled quiet, but maybe that was the expectation? Things, things like sound and smell, etc. These are variables that went into this hierarchy that I put together for the stages of readiness. Then there are three libraries I was taking my daughter to UCSD, where she's currently a, a freshman. And uh, as I was leaving Washington, D.C. to go there, the uh, ALA asked me if I would write an article about the implementation of makerspaces in certain libraries. So I visited 10 libraries, and I wrote an article about three of those. This is going to be a quick story about those three libraries and how they went about implementing makerspaces. And then from all the conversations that I've had, I've been able to distill some things that, this is how they usually came up in conversation. We could do this if only. It would be so much easier if only we had, there are some things, there are some five projects here that I've sort of distilled, if they were done, would make it a much easier job for libraries to implement makerspaces. So I'm going to be sharing with you what those five are. So let's get into the stages of readiness. I alluded to these variables, and the reason I just want to run through them quickly is because I'm going to go through these five stages, and it's these variables that change. So first, how open is a library environment to noise? Or can it be cordoned off so that noise can happen in one area and not in another area, that sort of thing? So openness to noise. Single, versus, single activities versus ongoing programs. Some libraries have events but they don't necessarily have a continuing theme, and I'll get into that in just a second. Traditional tools versus making tools. I just say traditional tools are the books, the videos, the DVDs, the things like that, versus making tools, which we've already covered yesterday. Multiple use versus dedicated use space. Is somebody willing to actually set aside a portion of the library for dedicated use, or do they try to just keep it for uh, multi-use, so that it can be used as a generic conference room for anything, or they'd be willing to set aside a space for something. And then clean versus dirty. That's pretty self-evident what we're talking about there. So one-off activities. Um, these are the things that I find most frequently. I, I um, arrived at my new home in, in Coronado and <laughs> went to the library, and I picked up their activity sheet. And there it was, uh, Thanksgiving time. And uh, the kids could come in and do folding uh, paper to make turkeys. <coughs> And then there was something lined up for two weeks later that was a one-time activity. I can't remember. It was a seasonal event. 
was tied, the other one was tied to a book, uh, and they're just one-off activities. So this is, this is the one-off activity level. There are all sorts of one-off activities that you can imagine. They happen all over the place. But in this, in this case, just to make the point, the, the space is multiple use, the tools are traditional tools, um, maybe a little bit of arts and crafts things. The frequency is whenever it's uh, an appropriate thing to do. Noise level is usually low, might make noise during the event, goes right to normal standards, and uh, cleanliness is uh, pretty, pretty uh, well maintained. So this is the one that we see vast majority of uh, activities going on in libraries that I visited. Then there's the ongoing meetups. This is where, for instance, uh, maybe the library is willing to have an amateur radio group come in and meet every Thursday evening from 6 to 9. Um, and yet, uh, maybe there's a high school robotics team that needs a space because they're complete, competing in the first robotics. They don't have any place to go to. For, so for six weeks, they need it three times a week for an hour in the afternoon. That sort of thing. Being willing to commit <laughs> the space for a recurring program that shows their support for that kind of an activity in the community. And there are all sorts of things, from sewing groups to Linux groups to, I mean, there's these kinds of groups are the ones. Frequency of activity, the willingness to support third-party programs in your space is the kind of thing that is happening at this second level, is ongoing meetups. The third stage is what I call temporary tools. And this one, I don't see very often, and I think it's really intriguing. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on this, because this is a story of, um, in particular, in this picture, this is the story of the Delamere Library. It's the engineering library at the University of uh, Nevada in Reno. And we were just taking a tour of the space. He's done some remarkable things, which I'll tell you about in just a minute. But I saw this behind the counter. And I, I happen to recognize the boxes, because I'm a geek. Okay? I know brand and that sort of thing. Um, here behind the counter we have, these are 12 Arduino prototyping kits. Now, what these are, are boxes filled with these Arduinos you folks have been petting in the petting zoo, um, and uh, resistors, breadboards. To a very great extent, they're cheap electronic components, but they're, they're bound together in this kit, and people can check it out, just go to the table, and they can start making circuits, and they can start fiddling with things. You know, the batteries are there, et cetera. When they're done, they check it back in, and it goes back on the shelf. Now, SparkFun, the company who does this, hasn't quite figured out how to do this well in a library. Like, for instance, I think a typical person who was handing this out and then receiving it back wouldn't necessarily know how to replenish hmm. what's been consumed. Wouldn't necessarily know that this kit was well designed so that most of it was reusable, say 95% reusable, but 5% was consumable. So you might burn out an LED, or you might lose a resistor or whatever. The person wouldn't necessarily know how to replenish it and make sure that this is still in good form for the next person who checks out. This is the kind of thing that SparkFun <laughs> and Make and others still need to figure out if they want to figure out how to get kits in libraries to be useful. But this was really intriguing because it started off with just, on a whim, he bought a bunch of these, they're about $100 each, and uh, one or two would get checked out on occasion, and then groups started to come in. And so they'd have a meetup in the library, and they'd be able to check out Arduino prototyping kits, and there was all sorts of this collaborative activity going on, lots of learning, a little bit of noise, but it was a new learning that was fueled from within by the people who had an interest in this sort of thing. And the library was a tremendous place for them to come and do this. These right here are electronics kits. These are more like tool kits rather than development kits. But here, somebody is, they purchased a kit that they needed to assemble, but they didn't necessarily have the solder and the wire cutters, the soldering iron, things like that that they needed to do this kit. So they came to the library, checked out the kit, they went over, they started working on it, and it's a quiet activity, but when solder is mm. used, <laughs> it has a resin core, and so that it flows well onto the circuit board. When resin melts, it also burns and creates smoke. How happy are most people smelling smoke in a book-filled room? <laughs> Not too. <laughs> 
But it can be something that you could get comfortable with. And it's an example of how, in this case, a kit would have caused folks to gather and learn together, or here, caused the environment to start getting used to the idea that smoke was okay. And uh, this level of readiness I saw very, very rarely, but it, it is an intriguing one to me, because one thing that I think <coughs> is missing is something that helps bridge the culture of libraries as they have been working for the last hundred years and libraries, how they could be working if they embraced making. There's this chasm, there's this gap. And it has to do with things such as smelling smoke, tolerance for noise, groups getting together, um, having your space be used on a regular basis for programs. And kits, interestingly, could be a catalyst that sort of bridge that gap. Yes? So, um if you have a kit, do you just let people make something and take it away, or do they have to take it apart and, and put it back? Like, how, how do people usually handle that sort of thing? Yeah, very good question. It was handled very badly in one of the stories I'll be telling you in a minute. Mm -hmm. They went out and bought a bunch of kits, and uh, the people built the kits, and that was that. It was an expensive little experiment. On there. <laughs> you didn't think it through. You want kits to be reusable. You want these things to be as high a percentage reusable as possible. They didn't want to be just a supplier of kits to the community who anybody could come in and build it and take it home. No, that wasn't the idea. And that's one of the things when I get later on in this presentation that uh, I think offers a lot of potential is there are kit makers who would love to figure out what kinds of kits make a lot of sense for libraries. And part of it is high reusability. Another is that it be something easily maintained that is to say, there will be consumable components. How do you find out which of those components are broken? How do you know what the proper inventory should be? Is there a replenishment kit that makes it very easy for those kits to be maintained? These are the kinds of things which I think would make for a good set of kits that could be used in libraries. And you wouldn't end up with, with what you were alluding to, which is um, a one-time use scenario, which is what they found at uh, tech center in Cleveland as they were just enthusiastically leaping into this and then quickly learning that that was probably not the best way to go. Anyhow, this third level of uh, readiness I call temp temporary tools and uh, you see that the tools are the ones that are, and it's kind of subtle, but I tried to bold the ones that were changing in each of these. I think next time it'll be a different color. Yes. And I just kind of raise the question, do people charge to come to these programs? Is that pretty much an expectation that... Would you, you, repeat, the you, would you repeat the question? Would you repeat the question? Yes, the, the question was whether these programs are something that uh, people have to pay for in order to participate in. If they were high in consumables usage, then you might expect that, yes. But the idea is to keep the consumables um, usage down to a bare minimum. So all you have to do is occasionally replace the solder that's in it or every, every few days someone reverses the polarity on an LED, burns it out, and it needs to be replaced, which is a few, a few pennies. So, no, to a great extent, it's supposed to be a continuation of the theme of, you know, these are free resources the library makes available, and they're great resources for learning, and there shouldn't be an additional fee for it. That's not to say that some of these programs don't have additional fees for them, but I think the general spirit of it is to maintain the same status as in the past. Let's go to number three. Number three, the notion of cleanliness and space are bolded here. As we go to excuse me, stage four, clean labs enter the picture. And here we have uh, a 3D printer that usually people put out fronts for everybody to see. Uh, it's, it's just a great symbol. We put examples of prints out there. Uh, but they can be used by the community. They make noise. There are stepper motors in various locations here. They make whirring sounds. Also, they're more expensive than just a screwdriver. You want to have it in a place that's relatively safe. So dedicating a space and being tolerant of noise, and this will have some you know, plastic debris occasionally. This guy right here is a laser cutter. Uh, this guy right here produces smoke. It should be vented to the outside. It's something which, however, will change the ambient air smell a little bit. So having it cordoned off, blocked off and ventilated, etc. 
our issues. So at this stage, which is the most popular stage, it's the one that has all the buzz associated with it, right? Mm -hmm. Ah, make your space in a library. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a big leap from traditional activities to this, hence that, that tools stage in between. But this is this level, level four, which does require an openness to sort of setting off a space, a dedicated area. This is an egg bot, in case anybody's curious. It's basically a, a plotter where you put in different colored pens, and it just knows how to draw on eggs. <laughs> Great, I bought one of these for our makerspace so that people could take them to elementary school classes and do demonstrations. The only requirement I had of them was, I'm going to buy this, but when you go to these classes, you must take an egg for each student. Because just like when someone sees a 3D printer, if they can walk away with a little piece that was printed on a 3D printer, they're going to hold it, they're going to think about it, they're not going to get it out of their heads. And to see that kind of precise drawing, on an egg is something which uh, you want them to wonder about. I want them to be able to aspire to do themselves. So this is the level four clean labs. Are the eggs hard boiled? Uh, usually you put a hole in the bottom and you drain out the, yeah. Which are, this, sorry, Trent, repeat the question on the microphone. I'm sorry, the question was, are the eggs normally hard boiled? And there's just no, there's no, um, uh, there's no egg in it. <laughs> This is, the, this is the highest level. This is uh, where you end up with um, sawing going on. You end up with, uh, well, I guess this is a 3D printer build, so that's not quite the bright picture. But here's a CNC mill. And this produces sawdust, can produce metal shavings and swimming. It's also quite noisy. If you put the wrong drill bit against the wrong material, they can make a terrible racket. Mm -hmm. There's only one library I know right now that actually has a dirty space, and they've actually pushed it off into their data center, which happened to have uh, spare space. It was unused. So I'll get to that in another story as well. But these are the five levels of readiness for a library. And as I say, the first two you guys are very familiar with. You see them all the time as I go around the country. This happens everywhere. This happens very, very rarely. But it seems like it would be a next natural step from the first sure. two. This is what everybody aspires to, but it also feels like a big leap for people up here. And then this, maybe. <laughs> Question. Um, is safety a concern where they have to sign off? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> safety is a concern, and they, they there's a whole protocol around it. Um, <coughs> making sure that people are trained in safety, making sure they've had a course on how to use a particular machine, being able to identify when someone has had the training or not, either through badging or through cards, like using the library card to actually enable the machine. Um, yeah, safety throughout is a big concern, but managed correctly, it has not really been an issue. But the managing has to be proactive and it has to be really leveraged from other people who've been successful, yes. Uh, separate insurance policy with it? And would you repeat we, it? We have... Repeat in, the question, Travis? Yes. Sorry. Separate insurance policy was the question. I can't say what libraries have done because I haven't come across enough that have the dirty lab. The clean lab, I haven't heard of anybody talking about a separate insurance policy. But at our makerspace, we had general liability and we had our insurance agent come through, see all of our tools, talk to us about it. Uh, he felt that we were covered in the insurance policy he gave us. And he specializes in not-for-profits that are things such as playhouses, which have lots of carpentry going on for set building. So he was really familiar with the environment, and he was comfortable with what we were doing was covered by insurance. Was there another question? Yes. Yeah, are, do you know if any libraries are associating the toolkits with one-off activities, like you would run a program to get people familiar with the kits, and then they could come back in their free time and have the kit available? O only libraries that I've gone to and talked to about it. Northern Virginia, for instance, in Chantilly and in Reston, both of those libraries are very excited about getting going on this. But it seemed like to get something onto their calendar, you need like a six month yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, it's problem. incredible. Like, I couldn't believe how long it would take. So, you know, the, there's no problem with gestation period here. <laughs> it's there and very long. Are you familiar with the IEEE kits that they are trying to get out in the libraries? No, I'm not familiar with those. Again. Okay. So the question was Am I familiar with the. Yeah, you keep queuing me on answering the questions. <laughs> um, no, I'm not familiar with the IEEE kits. I think that kits, I, when I was uh, a kid, Heathkit was around. It was a company. Yes, got a thumbs up over there. <laughs> Heathkit was around. I built a 
four channel stereo amplifier, my first amateur radio transmitter and receiver. These were great learning experiences. Kids kind of fell into the backwaters for a while there. But there are a lot of people looking at them now. I wasn't familiar with the IEEE. I do know that Make, uh, Adafruit, uh, Eat, let's see. Evil mad scientist. Um, there, there are a bunch of people out there who are looking at how to do this in a way that could be useful in different environments, schools, libraries, etc. And I think it's a, a resurgent interest, mainly because of what we were talking about yesterday, how all of these tools and these technologies, the microcontrollers and sensors, etc., are so empowering. Now I will follow up to find out about the IEEE kits. Yes? When you're talking about temporary toolkits yes. and, and kits in general, and how you said it makes <coughs> Circulated them, like have them for public to take home and use. Um, the the one that um, I showed you at the Dillon, the Repeat. question was, <laughs> has any library gone so far as to allow people to check these things out and then return them later? The Delamere Library does. Now I haven't seen many libraries that have Arduino prototyping kits, and it has maybe. 150 little pieces. It's kind of a, a little bit of an inventory to, to have to manage, but uh, they do it. They're an engineering school library. It makes sense that they would go so far as to do that. I think that that would, when I was talking with the folks in Chantilly, they kind of thought they'd like to get there, but it certainly wouldn't be where they'd start. And so edging in that direction as you get more comfortable, I think is pretty reasonable. Any other question which I will repeat for the camera? <laughs> <laughs> um. Yes. Are there any libraries that, oh, I get to say the question. Are there any <laughs> libraries that are perhaps um, finding other spaces to actually have the maker spaces rather than in the traditional library building? Yes, and I look forward to telling you story number okay. two. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, let's go ahead and get on to the next section here, which is models for implementation. Do you suppose that question was heard? <laughs> <laughs> Models for implementation. This is, a, this is what uh, was in the January issue of uh, LA Magazine. And um, the result of my trip across country was, again, visiting 10 libraries, but three in particular that I thought were different enough and interesting enough that they merited being written about. And the theme was models for implementation. That is to say, how can a library go on about implementing a makerspace? And in a word, Collaborate was one of them. The other two were centralized, develop, and deploy. Let's get rid of that pointer. Centralized, develop, and deploy. And then the opportunistic entrepreneurial. These are the three stories. These are three separate libraries. Let's get into them. The first one comes to your question about did they ever consider doing it outside of library? Jeff Kroll has been director of the Fort Wayne library system for going on 30 years. And his story about how he kept pushing into new areas is really quite interesting. But for him, he always found success in collaboration. That was a model that always worked for him. So when they had the performance arena put into their library, they had a partner on that. When they put in the radio station, and they put in the TV station, they had partners on that. When they put in the genealogy area, they had a partner for that. His method for doing things was collaboration. So it was his natural instinct to go through and try to figure out if he was interested in making, who could he collaborate with? And it just so happens that there was a maker space in town that was between spaces. So they were like the maker without space. <laughs> <laughs> and all of their inventory of tools, et cetera, had been packed away. And Jeff happened to know the gentleman. They talked. And uh, Jeff got cooperation from this makerspace, enthusiastic cooperation, because they were going to have a space as a consequence of this collaboration. And they put together a 10 by 60 foot trailer across the street from the Central Library. Mm -hmm. okay? This trailer was donated for the course of the summer. And this trailer was filled with tools from egg bots to 3D printers, mills to laser cutters, it was little versions of all of those things. And again, it was just across the street. Now, in the main corridor of this library, it's a huge two-story long court. It's a beautiful facility. Um, they, when you entered the library, they'd be promoting 
activities that were going on across the street here. The idea was, Jeff wasn't sure whether making was for his library or not. I think most people would go through that phase. How do I know if this is going to be right for my community? Am I serving the needs of my patrons if I do this? And he wanted to test the idea. He didn't want to use a lot of budget on testing it. So, some of the ingredients were a loaned trailer. It was across the street in the parking lot that was theirs. The maker space was putting in all the tools. The classes were given by the makers who were members of that maker space. And so over the course of two and a half months, Jeff had two whopping bills. The electricity for this facility <laughs> and extending the Wi-Fi that he already had. That was his cost in doing this test. Over the course of the summer, they did 54 projects in here. Not projects, they were classes, individual classes. And when I first learned that, I sort of internally scoffed saying, right, I'll bet it was 54. I bet it was five of them given 10 times. <laughs> no, there were almost no repeats. These makers were just so happy to have an audience to share their enthusiasm for an egg bot, uh, ring making, um, you know, new uses for an Arduino. They were just so happy to do that. They, this was just an outlet for them. And over the course of summer, let's see what I have here. It was, it was really well used. They ended up with a lot of patrons coming over here. And at the end, they sort of quieted it down, the experiment was over, and Jeff went back and sort of assessed the situation. Now, over the course of that summer, Jeff also used the fact that Makerspace was there to catalyze a culture change within his staff. So his staff, he would hold meetings over here. <laughs> he would also encourage his staff to participate in classes. So there wasn't any more this notion that, I have no idea what a Makerspace is or what goes on in it. It was, wow, you did that over there? Or, oh, we're meeting over there. And everybody knew what it was all about and knew what to expect. It really served the purpose of sort of preparing the staff of the library for some changes down the road. As I said, at the end of the summer, he quieted down. And uh, he's been assessing. Last I spoke with him was probably January sometime. And what he had concluded was that, I mean, they definitely wanted to move it into the main building because even though it was across the street, it was still a little too far for patrons. Some of the patrons needed to have this leap in order to just see that it was going to be worthwhile. But if they were in the main library and they could see a 3D printer in action, or see a sewing group doing its thing, that they would be much more likely to participate. And yet he also paused because he said, you know that, that dirty lab stuff? He had a mill in there, there was a lathe in there. It was not right for inside the library. So he had a data center, which I alluded to earlier, and it was a building that they got on the cheap a long time ago. His data center only occupies two-fifths of the building, and so he was planning on using some of the space in that data center for the dirty lab. That is to say, all the stuff that produces lots of smell, lots of noise, wood chips, things like that. And um, the makerspace was probably going to be the group that helped run that dirty lab and the clean lab, um, the Makerspace was, of course, thrilled at the prospect because they were getting some facility to use, which they didn't have previously, or they had lost the one they had previously. And Jeff was going to do it in an area. He already had mapped out in his mind this uh, glass-enclosed area on the first floor so that the noise could be contained, so that the sounds could be contained. Not that the clean lab made a lot of noises, but it was inconsistent with some of the other activities in the library. And so this is, through collaboration, how Jeff Kroll went ahead and tested the idea of, does the makerspace make sense for my community? And his conclusion was yes. The next story is in Cleveland. And one of the first things I wanted to tease out of, oh, I can't jump right into it because this is just, <laughs> I, I just felt like this was the angst I saw in so many people's faces when I first said, uh, have you just considered maybe putting tools for making in your library? <laughs> this look of angst was the reaction I would get from people I'd ask that question of. Uh, this is a 3D printer that they have right on the welcome desk inside of the Tech Central, which is, they cleared out a, an area on the basement floor that had been a, a video lending library and, and fixed it up. I'll get into that in just a second. But as you walk in, you see this, you see these examples of 3D prints. 
and this is what I alluded to yesterday. I, just, I, just, I enjoyed so much walking somebody, seeing somebody walk in and start staring at this and walking up to them and start talking to them about it, what it was they were seeing, and just watching the gears go on in their head and the eyes go wide and the sort of look of amazement at the possibilities that this was happening. And it was, it's really a wonderful thing to have people be exposed to 3D printing. But getting back to the story, Thomas Felton um, was the relatively recent director for the Cleveland Public Library. And uh, he, he was really wanting to do something that I hadn't heard phrased the way he phrased it. You know, you hear about closing the digital divide. He didn't put it that way. He says, I want people, when they are going through their lives and they're having a hard time between jobs or having the right skills, to not have the tools that all the rest of us take for granted be impediments for them. So if they're handed a pad, uh, an iPad, they may not know how to use it, for instance. We want them to understand how to do that. When it comes to new manufacturing, we don't want them to draw a blank when someone says 3D printer. We want people to be able to use the design software that they might be able to, might need to use in their next job, things like that. We wanted to remove these impediments that a lot of society takes for granted, and yet those who need it to get a new job and don't have it, would have the library to turn to. So this is the character of the um, network. And the reason I went to this extent in describing it is because while he can exercise some direct control over the 28 branches, their extended network of over 100 is really a more cooperative relationship. You can't push. He needs them to want to pull programs out to them rather than being told what's the right thing to do. So he wanted to take his approach in this context of developing the right thing at the central library and then as they are refined, pushing them out or allowing them to be pulled out. Let me describe what I mean by that. So this bottom floor, he cleared it out, brought the computers from most of the other floors to this floor because he said, you know, the people who were on those floors where all those computers were, weren't trained in computers, couldn't really answer the questions that people were asking them. It was a frustration for the um, patrons of the library. And so he, saw, he consolidated it down in this area, along with creating a series of round tables, presentation walls. Um, he put in place what he called the tech toy shop, where people could come check out tablets and try Kindles and different Android devices. It was a very different space from the rest of the library. It was also physically separated from the rest of the library. What he also did was he found sponsorship through a couple of companies, HP and Citrix, to help fund some of this. And he also applied a filter and did some shuffling of staff. So he didn't want to change staff out. He wanted to find people who had the right skills of understanding technology, maybe being good communicators of that technology, maybe being good training skills, and to filter them into this space. So there was a shuffling of staff around so that you got those kinds of people. He wanted to kind of be like a, an Apple store genius in the area. So people could come in and just ask questions and get help, and uh, he did that from amongst his staff. But the reason I described this in that level of detail, the sponsorship and shuffling of staff is he didn't have much budget to work with. And he had to do this within his budget plus whatever you get from the sponsorships. And um, he created this environment. It was, uh, only, it was only a few months old when I was there, maybe not even a few months, it was more like two months old at that point. And I got there before opening because of the, my logistics. People were outside waiting to get in. When the doors opened, there was a little flood. <laughs> it was really impressive. It was really well received by folks. Um, some of the things that they had done was, the reason they got that sponsorship from HP and Citrix was they created MyCloud, which is a service that you can go on and it's like your own computer desktop. Whenever you log in with your library card, it's not the generic desktop. It's your desktop. Folders are exactly where they are. All your documents are there. It's as though it was your computer. So anytime you log in, it's your space. And it had lots of programs. If you happen to have installed, say, a free program from the internet, it's there when you log in. It's not there for everybody. It's there for you. It's your desktop. This is one of the services he wanted to develop. And um, they make it available now in three of the branches. He developed, had 3D printing. He also has these programs sort of staggered 
in terms of how they mature and how, as they mature, they start communicating. And so his staff goes out to the branch network, takes a 3D printer with him and says, here's a 3D printer, and uh, what do you think? Would you think this would be the right thing for your library? He's trying to develop the pull so that the different branches will be asking for these things, so that when they get it right, when they get it figured out, they'll be in a good position to, to um, help transfer that technology and those programs into the branch network. But they don't always succeed. The kits that they bought were kits that people used once, and that was it. So they had to go back to the drawing board and figure out you know, what kinds of kits to implement. The process that he wants to do is what I've sort of been alluding to. Develop it right at a central point. When it's developed right, then use it locally to refine it and start communicating it out to the branches. Where you can and you think it's appropriate, push. Where you can't and they want it, then they'll pull. And you let it go right. Libraries know their communities. Libraries know their patrons. I went to this one Carnegie library up on the hill in Philadelphia. And it was with a bunch of folks who were just on the surface. I'm making a stereotypical quick conclusion here, but I'm just trying to make an example. They were very happy in a book-laden environment, and they wouldn't want a 3D printer within 10 blocks of them. That library was not going to be the right one for a 3D printer. You, you know your libraries, the individual libraries know their patrons, and you can't just assume that it's going to go out. So Felton wanted to do the right thing in the right places, and this was his methodology. Uh, when I was last there, he was talking about his budget. Uh, it was that very day. I should call him and find out exactly what happened. But the budget for the following year was going to include more kits. They wanted a laser cutter and a CNC mill. So you could see that they were really progressing down that path. They had started with the clean stuff and some kits, but they were already getting ambitious for this year. And um, I need to find out what the uh, results were. What time do I have to? Do you know what time I have to? Oh, good Lord. 10 after. 10 after? Okay. Thank you. Double 10. Okay. So I mentioned this one before, but I'm going to get into it a little bit more. The Delamere Library in Reno is a library that is the engineering library of that branch of the university. And uh, I can't not talk about the elephant in the room. <laughs> Um, just like the word hacker, which is stigmatized, even though it just means someone who likes to fiddle around with things and, and, and sort of improve upon them, lockpicking has a stigma as well. And if you look at it from the perspective of a mechanical engineer's mind, a mechanical engineer's mind, it's a mechanical system. It's intriguing. There are different kinds of locks with different kinds of mechanisms to figure out how they work. It's remarkable. At my makerspace, we have a once a month meeting where people learn to do lock picking. It's a remarkably social event. People have such a sense of joy when they, for the first time, oh, have the lock open up, you know, because they were successful. And you're, in your mind, understanding the mechanical system that it is and some variations on it. There's an ethic that goes along with this, which is, of course, if his lock is installed, you don't mess with it. But, you know, it's a skill set that somebody could mis misuse. And yet, they have these kits behind the desk for people to check out. I mean, you know, this is kind of cool. In an engineering school where mechanical engineering is one of the disciplines, it kind of makes sense. Let, let's talk about the low cost of this. This box, a few dollars, right? This is not a big investment for a library to make. Let's see, you had 10 of them, which is really kind of a nice setting. You get a group going, they learn from one another, and then somebody else comes in next Tuesday because I think we want to try that new kind of lock, you know? And it's it's a it's an opportunity to do something that's learning when a group is there, it's a participatory activity. Uh, it's really kind of cool. But back to the story. Todd Caldgrove is a uh, a research physicist. He has uh, nothing to do with libraries until a couple years ago. <laughs> and he has always in his mind's eye thought about his version of what the great library of Alexandria was. This debating, testing, uh, discussing, uh, testing of hypotheses, experimenting kind of environment where that's how you learn. That's what was going on in that place. And it may be just a myth, some vision that he wanted to believe in, but it doesn't make any difference. It was what he wanted to create in this library. 
He came in to be the librarian of the engineering school library. <clears throat> he got there, he was dead quiet all the time. It was a 23,000 square foot facility, a 21,000 square foot facility. Only 3,000 square feet were available for tables and people. All the rest were books. Um, he could have a maximum, I believe at the time, was about 24 people at peak time, which is what we found in this four-story library because of the way it was set up. And just as with the other stories, there were really no resources to go about doing what he wanted to do, so we had to start getting creative. He wanted more space, he wanted more tables, he had no money, and yet he was bound and determined to make a change. So he was entrepreneurial and opportunistic, as you'll see in the next few examples. The library happened to have an automated retrieval and storage system, so he could actually have moved a lot of his books there if he wanted to. So he did an inventory and looked at the utilization of different journals and different books and found like the vast majority of them were very, very rarely checked out. So he made a, uh, an analysis, pushed the vast majority off to the central uh, library's uh, A, what does the acronym you folks use? Automated Retrieval Storage, ASR, ARS? Whatever it says up here. ASR. ASR, thank you. Um, and thankfully, he got the support of the community to do that. And all of a sudden, he had 18,000, not 3,000 square feet of open space. Of open space. No tables, no chairs, nothing. And he said, I better fix this quick, or somebody's going to start questioning the, uh, the uh, intelligence of what I'm doing here. <laughs> He found that there was an old library on campus that had been closed because of asbestos. And there were just tables and chairs gathering dust in this place. So he got permission and got the help of facilities to go raid it. Mm -hmm. The local high school was about to get rid of surplus tables and chairs because they were replacing them and they were about to go to auction. He asked if we could have them and he got them for free. So all of a sudden the space was filled with tables and chairs. but one thing he always wanted was lots of place for people to draw and take notes and, and deliberate over and argue over. In other words, whiteboards. But boy, were they expensive. You know, he, he went and bought whiteboards and he said, well, I have about one-tenth of what I really want. That's all the budget I have. So he got creative at that point. Again, the theme here is opportunistic and entrepreneurial. He found this stuff called idea paint. And he realized that since he removed all these shelves, he had exposed a lot of walls. Now whenever he gets money, he goes out and buys a few gallons of idea paint and creates more white surface. And as you walk through the library, I mean, there's drawings everywhere, and this place is fantastic. He made so much floor space available in part by getting rid of a lot of office closed off areas. He has a cubicle in one corner, and he says now he looks out from his cubicle across the floor and there is just activity going on all the time. Not quiet activity, people are talking, people are gathering. I have a picture of a bunch of people who um, are sitting there working on picking locks. Um, I, I showed up and he just spontaneously pulled together, I think 30 or 40 people from the library. He said, look, come listen to this. He'll have spontaneous talks, he'll have um, anything that helps people learn in that interactive, collaborative environment, uh, he'll foster. And he says he's already seeing great success. Some of the things, though, even though he didn't have budget, he managed to pull off, such as he needed a magnet to bring people into this facility. You can't just put a bunch of tables and chairs and whiteboards and expect like people are going to say, oh, that's magical, I'm going to go there. <laughs> What's the big deal with that? <clears throat> he wanted something that was going to get everybody's attention. And he decided that was going to be 3D scanning and 3D printing but not just on the retail level, not the kind of things that I've messed with, not the kind of things that most people buy for you know, $1,000, $2,000. No, he wanted to have some really good stuff. He wanted to make it available, not just to students, not just faculty, but the community. And he managed to, with the help of the Dean of Libraries and a few other people, pull together a budget from just scraps everywhere. A little bits here, here. John had some tucked away for a rainy day, you know, he just pulled it all together. And he managed to get some, I don't know, it was $30,000 or something like that. And he got a really nice couple of 3D printers, a 3D scanner, and he put them in the lobby 
of the library. Now, you cannot get to any part of the library without going through this lobby. And so it was there for people to look at, and it was very apparent once you start to look at it, it wasn't just for looking at it. You could use it. This was a resource available to you. You didn't need to have anything other than some training or just the files that they could then use for producing it. And it got so much buzz. I mean, everybody was so excited about this, especially, as he had hoped, the engineering schools. These folks were very excited about being able to prototype using these resources. But then something strange happened. It wasn't just the engineering schools, because they already had access to some of these things already. But the people in the poetry department, who had always wanted to do something, or people who were in social sciences who wanted to collaborate with a friend of theirs who was an engineer, it, it, got, it permeated into the community of the university in a way that he hadn't foreseen. And um, the press and the buzz that came from all of this has uh, really served to reinforce the fact that he's, he's done something important here. He's a model for other people to follow. And his approach to pulling it off in a no-resources environment was to go about being entrepreneurial and opportunistic. So the three models that we talked about were Jeff Kroll's uh, collaboration. This is the leader of the makerspace. And this is the makerspace. You can see here's an oscilloscope. Here you have a laser cutter. Back here you have a mill. You have a 3D printing station in here. This was what it was like inside that uh, 60 by 10 foot trailer. So his was collaboration. Centralized develop and deploy is was what Felton did. And this is just their high tech uh, station where you could just check out tablets and Android devices and iPads and things like that and use them there or check them out to take them home, etc. But you could get your hands on the technology. And then there was what was done in the Delamere Library, and especially the catalyzing impact of the 3D printer, but through entrepreneurial and opportunistic means. But every one of these people was a library director. I mean, these people were able to do this because from their position, they could muster resources or make changes of the scale that was useful to the library. What about the rest of us? What about the hundreds and thousands of other libraries that don't have that particular leadership and resourcefulness? How can they maybe pull this off? Does that sound like a segue to you? <laughs> <Yeah>? <laughs> Good, because it is. <clears throat> the point here was the absence of leadership, in the absence of leadership, we need to catalyze, let's see, we need a catalyst and tools to ease the transition. Tools and programs which just fit into the way a library operates today. Activities which cultivate a value change and a map to bridge the divide between the way libraries operate now and the way they can operate in the future as they embrace this additional strategy. So these are facilitation initiatives. And uh, I think you've probably heard me allude to most of these, but I'm going to give you a little bit more detail on them. What I'm personally most excited about, as you may have determined this morning, is kits. Um, kits alongside books. Um, let's see, we can get making into libraries now, pursue a development and testing program. So let me just go back to the Delamere Library. Behind the shelf were all those Android prototyping kits and the lock picking kits and the electronics toolkits. He just bought them. I mean, he, he didn't know any better. I talked to the CEO of uh, SparkFun. He says, yeah, we'd love to do the right thing for libraries, but we have no idea what that is. That's not what we are. And so there is this need for the insight of how a library operates, insight for what would be useful in a library, insight from just the culture of the library, what will work, etc. that needs to be married with what these kit manufacturers can do, which is make different builds, make replenishment kits, write documentation, etc. But these two pieces need to come together in such a way that through iteration, trial and experimentation, the kits can be refined to work well in a library. People are interested on the kit building side of doing this. They need a team. <laughs> they need a team of library leaders who can help them in 
building this idea out. And frankly, as I step back, I think <clears throat> it's actually more than the library environment and the kit making environment. I think there's probably some um, uh, education insight that needs to be a part of the mix. There's probably some uh, engineering insight from a teaching of engineering perspective needs to be a part of the mix. This could be a, a relatively small project or it could be a relatively big project. It could be a short term or a long term, depending upon how people define it to be in the beginning. <laughs> But helping libraries by getting the right kits built to be used in libraries and testing and learning what works could be a very important step in terms of putting kits out there that can help bridge the gap. We can hasten the base of change if we develop the right kinds of kits. Other resources that are needed. Project portal for libraries. This is a website that has projects in it so that there's no reason in the world to think that a person who's been doing whatever they've been doing in a library would today do that well and then tomorrow be able to do projects. I mean, just like a crazy leap of faith if you think that that is possible. They need people in the community to help. They need resources like a projects database. And this projects database is what I'll be talking about in just a second. Best practices sharing. Right now, I think it's just luck if you find out about what worked here or what John's doing over there or how Sally made a mistake over there or whatever. It's, there's no that there's no system systematized regular best practices sharing. Also I found that funding of course is always an issue but libraries tend to think about their traditional funding sources when they start thinking about what they'll do with makerspaces. Um, just because I do some things with Make Magazine, a company behind it is called Maker Media, I know that it's non-traditional funding sources that come forward when they realize what this making is all about. I'll give you a small, slightly off-center uh, example. My makerspace, we have a great laser cutter. We have a 3D printer with lots of filament. We have lots of computers. We didn't have money to buy all that. It turns out that Palantir, a company that happens to be nearby really likes the mentality of makers. That is to say, they're, they're the ones who can sort of seize control, they can take ideas and make them real, and uh, that is something which uh, they only realized when they found out about the maker movement, and they decided they wanted to fund. All those things I told you they gave us were less than one recruiting fee, okay? So they've already hired two people from our maker space, and they've made out like bandits. So there are non-traditional sources that have only now the opportunity to consider funding something like this. And Make Magazine, for instance, has GE and um, uh, Autodesk and Tech Shop and a bunch of people who wouldn't normally fund things like this. Let me just move ahead to the last one, which is um, curate, curating a, making, a maker directory. Libraries need to have people they can turn to. And turning to a directory, which has, for my community, these craftsmen, these makerspaces, these folks in industry who all expressed a willingness to help and who are good in perhaps <laughs> training and leading group activities. If there was a database like that, then it could be a lot easier for libraries to uh, get things going. So I'm not going to be able to go into these next few, but this is just real briefly what the projects database looks like for, from Make. And uh, this is the one that is from Instructables. And there was a team here, who's the ones? Yes, you folks uh, right there have already expressed an interest in talking with Instructables. This is just a prototype. This is actually even my graphic, it's so crude. This was just for a presentation once upon a time. But they've actually built this now, and hopefully we'll be working with that team to um, iterate and make it better. There's something like, I think it's like 80,000 projects in their database. And there's a whole community side to this, and curriculum, and downloadable PDFs, and it's a huge resource. It's really wonderful. Uh, so, the Projects Portal, portal we talked about, we talked about best practices, but <coughs> it is, as I say, through just chance that people find out what works and what doesn't. And that can be done through newsletters, a portal, uh, some programs that are ongoing, but it would be best if people didn't have to start from scratch. They shouldn't have to begin at the beginning. They should be able to begin where the last person left off. And best practices sharing could be done a whole lot better. New funding sources, I already made my point on that one. 
don't get locked into traditional think that old funding sources are the right ones for your efforts in maker spaces. New funding sources are very likely available and you just need to unearth them. And uh, the database would have people such as hobbyist stores and hacker spaces and craftsmen that a local community had so that the library could turn to them and say, we'd like to do something with toothpick, ar toothpick architecture. Could you, since I heard that you're a hobbyist on this other sort of thing, come in and do a session of that for us? Having a resource like this to be able to find people to help you implement in the library would be really useful. So the fifth of the uh, facilitation initiatives is a, a maker database that libraries could turn to. Those are the five, and this is what we've covered. I think that there's a great opportunity, and I'm really glad to have been able to talk to a bunch of library leaders who can make a difference in some of these areas. So again, thanks very much for the opportunity to have spoken. We have time for a couple of questions. His symbol was peace, but he meant two, two questions. So go ahead. Uh, have you seen any makerspaces in school libraries at all? Well, one of my partners in crime is, have you I'm sorry, the question was, <laughs> <laughs> uh, have I seen makerspaces in school libraries? Um, no, I haven't. And it's only because I haven't looked. The, my partner in crime on this is Dale Doherty, and he's very, very into the school side of things. We're sort of trying to attack different institutions of society. He's very big on schools, he has a not-for-profit that he's set up, he's got a lot of initiatives going on, and libraries are very distinctly one of the places in a school after, you know that shop class that has dust over all the equipment that's in there, that hasn't been entered, that room hasn't been entered into for years? That's the first place where things could happen in a school. But libraries are obviously a very good alternative, and uh, I can easily put you in touch with people in that program who you could learn about libraries and schools that might have major spaces. Yes? Uh, I know you said there was that company that's close to your space that ended up hiring yeah. people, but in terms of other partners, what did you, or what do you see as, you know, in it for them? And what do they want out of the deal? So what is it that, how am I doing? I remember to answer I, question. I, I'm shocked. I'm wondering. <laughs> <laughs> what is it that potential funders would be looking for if they were to fund makerspaces and libraries. Well, one of the things is just that this is a up-and-coming movement that people talk about a lot. It's got a lot of buzz. So Cognizant, for instance, is a company that really wants to be associated with bringing learning through these activities into science museums. And so it is part of their messaging and if that is their messaging and they can further it by giving a little <laughs> bit of money to some causes, then it helps them with their messaging. So that's one example. Um, so potential hiring, messaging, um, when it comes to education, people are trying to figure out new ways that are more effective for educating. Going back to hands-on, collaborative, participating activities, when those are the themes of what's going on in a library makerspace, then they can easily say to themselves, this is a good investment for what we want to achieve with our uh, monies to the outside for leveraging uh, activities in new learning. So there, there are a variety of themes like that. Those are the three that come to mind right off the bat. And with that, Alas. I just one, one last question. Could you share with us your email? Oh, sure. <laughs> So my email address is my name, Travis Good, T-R-A-V-I-S-G-O-O-D. And you can throw an at Yahoo. At